President of Waiklu provides update of her meeting with Member of Parliament for the National Alliance. President of Waifu explains the conditions of the three islands and the restrictions. And Minister of Finance responds to the June payroll support payment from the SFV. Those are the headlines for Friday, September the 4th, 2020. Good evening, viewers. This is SXM Daily News. I am Valerie Van Putten. And as usual, we have a full newscast for you this evening, so let's get started. In our first story, fielding questions from a media personality on Wednesday last at the Council of Ministers press briefing, Minister of Finance, the Honorable Artwell Irion, responded on the June payroll support payment from the SFV. The minister was asked, what is the plan? When are we going to move things along? When will we have a transparent and concrete plan as to how we are going to support financial stability for the island as it doesn't seem to be working and is creating tons of stress among employees and employers? And what is the plan for October when we run out of money? Um, the abuse of the employees did not start in June. So complaints came in before June. So let's be very clear when we talk about abuse of employees. The complaints that we got in are not because of June. In April, employees were supposed to pay 100%. In May, they were supposed to pay 100%. The complaints are not coming in. The, the current complaints are not June. So when you ask the question, what are we doing? It goes back again to the employers. What were you doing? The, it was then clear. So it isn't about rhetoric about the abuse, yes, the abuse is, for example, we are still getting complaints currently about simple letters of dismissal letters for the income and unemployment support that has been financed up until October already. We're asking the employers simply give a dismissal letter to the employees so they can apply for this money, so that they can apply. So, so what I'm talking about abuse, yes, there's still abuse in this fact of, hey, um, you're off, you're off my payroll, your contract is over, and I have nothing else to do with you anymore. The problem is they can't get the income on unemployment support because of a simple dismissal letter. Um, and as you may know that the payroll support changed in June, not because the Ministry of Finance or the government wants to do this, it changed because that were the conditions set by the Netherlands. Um, we had two months of the of the former system, and the last month of June changed because of the of the conditions set by the Netherlands. We I also confirmed this morning with SV that payments have started today for the payroll support. So payments have started today and will continue in the next couple of days. And in other news for you at this time, member of the anti-poverty platform, Dr. Randers Raymond Gessirun, says that there are serious omissions regarding monies from the Dutch. The member of the anti-poverty platform says that the Council of Advice for St. Martin gave arguments to explain why the Dutch government, as the money lender, is in principle free to set conditions for liquidity support. Mr. Gessirun expounded further. Serious omissions in the advice of the St. Martin Council of Advice about monies from the Dutch. In the Daily Herald of September the 1st, 2020, under the heading, As Money Lender, The Hague is Allowed to Set Conditions, the Council of Advice of St. Martin gave arguments to explain why the Dutch government, as the money lender, is in principle free to set conditions for liquidity support. The Council compared the situation to a contract between a client and a commercial bank. The bank set conditions to secure as much as possible a situation where the loaned money plus the interest is repaid. Not even in the European Union has the Dutch government been compared to a commercial bank. Even in the European Union, the position of the Dutch government to demand conditions to the COVID-19 aid to other European countries was rejected. So why in the kingdom, we in the Dutch Caribbean countries cannot receive aid 
just as the Dutch citizens in the Netherlands and the Bass Islands, and just as all other European citizens in the European Union, as aid and not as a loan. So shortcoming number one, nowhere in the advice did the Council of Advice ask the question, if COVID-19 financial support to kingdom citizens in the different territories of the kingdom should be provided equally. Some territories can get assistance as a loan and some can get assistance as aid. That's inequality. The council argued that the law doesn't state that mutual assistance based on Article 36 of the Kingdom Charter must be unconditional and as such legally enforceable. Again, the Council of Advice did not ask a fundamental question based on Article 43 of the Charter of the Kingdom to guarantee human rights also in a disaster situation like the COVID-19 pandemic in the different territories of the kingdom. May the Dutch government violate Article 2 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and impose discriminatory conditions on citizens in the Caribbean countries of the kingdom and not on other citizens in the kingdom? Not considering this question is another serious shortcoming of the ones who prepared this advice. In the Council of Advice opinion, the Netherlands or the kingdom in principle may set non-financial conditions to the providing of a loan. The council argues that the need to set conditions apparently was the result of the findings in reports of the International Monetary Fund and the recommendations of various institutions, including the Committee for Financial Supervision, the General Audit Chamber, the Ombudsman, the Central Bank of Curaçao and St. Martin, the Social Economic Council, the Foundation Government Accountants Bureau, SOAB, and the Council of Advice. But here we see, again, another shortcoming of the Council of Advice. Since the full realization of economic, social, and cultural rights in the Kingdom of the Netherlands has to be promoted on a progressive, non-discriminatory measure, why didn't the Council of Advice argue or follow the advices of the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in their different observations and recommendations to the Kingdom? And now in news out of Curaçao, the Caribbean reform entity, CHE, cannot be changed. This was declared by Undersecretary Raymond Knops of the Interior and Kingdom Relations. In response to questions from the media, he does not want to say whether the two countries have come together. He leaves no room for doubt about the CHE. The conditions cannot be waived, says Knops. Prime Minister Eugene Ruganath says that after the talks with Knops that he hoped that an important step in the right direction has been taken in this way to ensure the necessary financing that Curaçao currently needs. Knopf says that he has, he has had good conversations, but he does not think it wise to make any statements about the content of the conversations now. I am not going to give the interim status of conversations every week, said the Undersecretary. There have been good discussions where we do not agree on all points. Whether the two countries have come closer together, Knops leaves in the middle. And still to come, President of the White Clue provides update of her meeting with a member of parliament for the National Alliance. And I'll have the details to that story and much more when SXM Daily News returns. GEBE -E has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. 
We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective, and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, powering a brighter future. Our friend Mega Wadi is here with tips to save you. Welcome back, viewers. You're watching SXM Daily News, and I'm Valerie from Fitton. And in COVID-related news at this time, as of September 3rd, St. Martin has confirmed nine new cases of persons who have tested positive for the coronavirus, COVID-19. The new total of positive cases now stand at 504, 504. The Collective Prevention Services, CPS, are monitoring 176 people in home isolation. 183 active cases have been registered of persons who contracted COVID-19. Seven patients are currently hospitalized, and the total number of deaths due to COVID-19 remains at 19. The number of people recovered since the first case surfaced on St. Martin remains at 302. 141, 141 people are now in quarantine based on contact tracing and investigations carried out by CPS of persons who may have been in contact with any of the active cases. In efforts to control the spread of the virus, CPS has tested 820 travelers arriving at the Princess Juliana International Airport and 1,630 people throughout the community. As the numbers of positive cases continue to increase, CPS will continue to actively execute its contact tracing measures. If you have been exposed to someone with the virus or experiencing flu-like symptoms, remain at home and contact your family doctor immediately. Continue to practice the guidelines implemented to further reduce the spike by wearing your masks, practicing social distancing, avoid greeting by hugging and kissing, sanitize your hands as frequently as possible, wash your hands with soap, and refrain from mass gatherings. And in more news at this time, President of the Windward Island Chamber of Labor Unions, Claire Elshott, had a virtual meeting with a member of parliament for the National Alliance, Christophe Emmanuel, on Sunday last, August 30th, to discuss the proposed agreement. The white crew president was asked for an outcome of that meeting and she provided an update. But it is also the objective of us as unions in the WICLU um, gracing the platform of the parliament to also express our concerns and to get parliament that far to understand that workers' rights are human rights, not that they don't understand, but they as parliament would need to enact some laws that would bring more social protection to our shores, more equality within the relationship of the workers, um, things that are lacking behind. For example, when was the minimum wage index at the last time that it was indexed? Did you hear anyone in parliament asking the Minister of ESA, for example, where is the draft that we would have to sign off to agree with that? There was a fast track on raising the pension age, raising the AOV age, but a lot of people don't know. Sometimes you have workers out there, they're asking questions. They will ask questions. When I have three contracts, what are the last date? Does the last date that I have to go home for three months and then before I can become permanent or whatever, it's a total mix up within the workers in the field as to what, as far as I know, the last dates, after three contracts, the fourth contract becomes permanent. We have seen for many years employers manipulating that, um, that law. They have been twisting and turning and creating their own vision version on that law, they have, as we would call it, abused that law. They've been ping-ponging the workers around and nobody to actually defend that, person, that work. 
So by bringing these programs out, um, I think the population would hear also the voice of the unions because we have right now within, um, to me, the Council of Ministers is a popular, the Prime Minister talks, we have on Wednesday, we have the, the, the um, what do you call it, the Council of Ministers prep briefing, but what are they telling the, peer, the people? The things that they bring forward is more confusing. And a lot of times when they go to Parliament, they would tell Parliament, yes, we spoke with the unions. So the public at large would understand or would try to find out or they spoke to the unions. Did the unions agree? They would even go that far as to say, as to say that they have an agreement with the unions while these things are far far from the truth. So not to say that they're lying, but you have to understand they are white lies, and then we would have to correct. As unions coming forward, we would also educate the people as to their rights, the workers. We would also emphasize things that are violations, and we would be looking at the same members of parliament who are now um, inviting us to have this go live and have um, this go public, we'll be looking at them to also initiate and enact laws that will protect the workers' rights and the human rights of the people of St. Martin and also to come up with budgets and things that would, um, how you would say, that would, would really target the social and economic development and growth of the people of this island. And now turning to our weather forecast for September the 4th, 2020. Two areas of interest associated with a tropical wave and a low pressure system are located over the mid and eastern tropical Atlantic. Gradual development of these systems is expected early next week as they move generally westward. The Meteorological Department of St. Martin will continue to monitor these systems and update the public accordingly. So the outlook through Sunday midday, partly cloudy with a few brief showers possible. Now let's turn to your three-day forecast. And still to come, President of WIFO explains the conditions of the three islands and the restrictions. And we'll have the details of that story and more with SXM Daily News. Make use of WIB mobile banking with easy access and direct usage of face recognition. PIN code. Or fingerprint. Download WIB mobile banking app and make your transaction from anywhere at any time. For more information, visit wib-bank.net forward slash quick dash login. Welcome back, viewers. As we continue now with this evening's news, earlier this year, on February the 25th, 2020, a covenant was signed between the Ministry of Justice, the Prosecutor's Office, the St. Martin Police Force, KPSM, and Foundation Judicial Institute St. Martin, SJIB in order to facilitate electronic monitoring EM in the justice system. This form of digital incarceration is one of where electronic ankle bracelets are used to monitor the movements of detainees who are granted temporary release. These electronic ankle bracelets have been used on nine occasions since March of 2020 and brought much needed relief to the capacity of the Point Blanche prison and house of detention. Electronic monitoring is used on selected inmates to suspend their pretrial detention. It is also used as an option to allow for conditional sentences ordered by a judge or conditional release from prison. It has been established that there is a misconception among lawyers and prisoners that prisoners have a right to go on early conditional release with electronic monitoring. That is incorrect. 
the criminal code does not entail a right for prisoners to go on electronic monitoring prior to their conditional release. Neither does the covenant nor the fact that electronic monitoring has been used in the past for the early conditional release of a prisoner to create such a right for all prisoners. The hardware and software for the electronic ankle bracelets are, are provided by a private company contracted by the Ministry of Justice. However, this contract is coming up for evaluation. As such, the Ministry of Justice will look into the bidding process once more and is asking interested companies to be on the lookout for the launch of the bid. Minister of Justice Ms. Anna Richardson stated that SJIB is still responsible body for the guidance and overall supervision of participants of the electronic monitoring program. However, the minister looks forward to the new bid being carried out soon in order to ensure the continued success of the program through the provision of hardware and software. President of the WIFO, Theophilus Thompson, speaking at the press briefing for the anti-poverty platform on Thursday last, in addressing the issue of us being kingdom partners, explained the conditions of the three islands and the restrictions. I'd like to draw two fundamental uh, concepts of leadership, which is vision and knowledge. Lack of vision, the people will perish. Lack of knowledge, people will perish. And we can see those that evident among our leadership, political leadership on our island. Lack of vision for the future. And not a one year vision or four years vision, but at minimum, at least a long term, 25 years vision for development of the population, the inhabitants, the citizens of your country. That is what's happening in the world. That's why today uh, the European Union is willing to spend millions of euros to assist Lebanon in their crisis and other parts of the world. As you know, Lebanon was once a colony for, of France, but they're still maintaining the same thing they're doing in Africa, where most of African countries are still controlled by the French Republic where millions of euros are taken from African countries to be placed in the central bank in France. The same thing, most of the oil all over the world has big uh, Netherlands investment. They were willing to go to war a couple of months ago in Venezuela to protect their rights and take away the rights of those persons there. Thank God because uh, that war didn't take place because of two Caribbean leaders we told uh, the American leadership that dialogue is more relevant and more important than going to war. But already, Curacao and Aruba was already given out, and St. Martin given out as post to stage a military invasion of Venezuela. And lack of knowledge of the way how these countries in the world operate all of the treaties of the United Nations and the ILO, which the Netherlands has signed off to, to protect workers and to protect human rights, they, they have all been violated by, by the leadership in the Netherlands. And our leaders apparently doesn't have the knowledge of those treaties that keep repeating every press conference that we have been keeping by Brother Jezeroon and Sister Claire, which are very important to equip our leadership with the knowledge that instead of going to the Hague as beggars, they go not as beggars, but they go as equal within the kingdom arena. St. Martin is still a colony, and the obligation as a colony by the kingdom colonizer. Until St. Martin becomes an independent country, the UN in its uh, Charter has outlined responsibilities and obligations of the colonizers to take care of the colonies, uh, education, uh, culture, all aspects. As a matter of fact, that's why there is the 17 
so, uh, SDGs. And number one is no poverty. Then there's no hunger. Quality education. That's the obligation of the signatories of the countries of the UN towards their colonies and towards those that they have authority over. Here on St. Martin, we got a problem where an introduction of cutting of salaries imposed by the kingdom uh, government in The Hague, which is breeding poverty and hardship on our people. And all of those things are violations of conventions and treaties and agreements and understanding towards uh, the people, not only of one part of the world, like in the Caribbean, but the entire world. That those are international rights and treaties signed off by the so-called big powers. Disaster coordinator Clyde Richardson says that we must remain vigilant. It's our personal responsibility to be prepared this hurricane season. And I'll have a detail to that story when SXM Daily News returns. Welcome back, viewers. And as we end this edition of SXM Daily News for this evening, Fire Chief and National Disaster Coordinator Clive Richardson is once again appealing to the community of St. Martin to be prepared as the country is now in the peak period of the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. He says that we must continue to remain vigilant and monitor daily weather reports from the Meteorological Department of St. Martin, the MDS, at www.meteosxm.com. An average Atlantic hurricane season, which runs from June the 1st to November the 30th, produces 12 named storms, of which six become hurricanes, including three major hurricanes. The 2020 season is like no other and has already seen the 15th named storm form. According to forecasters, the 15th named storm, like the other storms with letters C, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and O, have all formed ahead of the other storms on record. There are only six named storms left in the English alphabet this year for storm names. The World Meteorological Organization will transition to the Greek alphabet, which was also the case in 2005 if all names are used up. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, of the U.S. Department of Commerce National Hurricane Center, NHC, falls under the NOAA. Most recent upgraded outlook calls for up to 25 named storms, of which 7 to 11 will become hurricanes, including 3 to 6 major hurricanes of Category 3 or more. The remaining storm names for the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season are Paulette, René, Sally, Teddy, Vicky, and Wilfred. Richardson is calling on the community to use the time now to recheck storm preparations and to be prepared for the remaining months of the 2020 hurricane season. The community and new residents are urged to learn more about hurricane hazards and how to prepare for a storm or hurricane strike by visiting the government website www.stmartingov.org slash hurricane where you will be able to download your hurricane season readiness guide and hurricane tracking chart. And with that viewers, we've come to the end of this edition of SXN Daily News for this evening. I am Valerie Gompertin, thanking you so much for joining me. And just a reminder that this and other programs are available online. Simply log on to stmartinmediacenter.com for viewing. And on behalf of the SXM Daily News team, we thank you for watching and plan on meeting you right back here again on Monday. Do enjoy a safe 
and lovely weekend.